We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. A real pleasure to welcome to the program Jeff Madrick, author of Age of Greed, The Triumph of Finance and the Decline of America, among uh, other uh, books and uh, contributions to other media pub, uh, publications. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Jeff. My pleasure. Uh, the title also says 1970 to the present, I just wanted to point out. Well, let's. Uh, we, we will actually we'll get to that because um, this is a... Uh, I guess in the annals of American history, uh, a, a relatively recent phenomenon, not so much greed, but the triumph of, of greed and, and finance. Let's, let's start with the question, what is finance supposed to do? What is the financial industry supposed to do for a country, for a society, and, and, and what has it, has it become in, in right. that sense? Good question. Uh, the primary thing it is supposed to do is allocate the nation's savings to the nation's business, to productive investment. Some of it low-risk investment, low-risk business loans to keep companies going, the old thing the commercial banks used to do. Some of it riskier ventures, new ideas, new expansions, new companies through equity, stock, and other new kinds of securities. Of course, secondarily, it provides a, a way for much of America to invest in business in America, and that's no small matter. We can invest our money, but that has to be a fair investment and, a control, and in my view, regulated kind of investment. So, What's so happened is we've misallocated this capital. And I know you're going to get to that. We've been misallocating this capital since the 1970s. All right. So, I mean, so finance is a, is a crucial uh, industry for any type of growing or functioning uh, society. But we have this misallocation now. And, 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 and what is that a function of? Well, I think that's a function, and I trace this in a book. It's always hard to write a, a longish book book and then, and then capsulize it very quickly. But I trace it to what was basically an assault on government in the 1970s that was victorious. It changed the attitudes of much of America towards the purpose of government. It made much of America want to limit government and allowed much of America con to condone a deep philosophical, profound deregulation of the financial business. And that began in the 1970s, not in the 1990s or the 2000s. Uh, finance is not like uh, selling autos or selling chewing gum. It is a very special kind of product subject to all kinds of whim, manipulation, and speculation. And it requires close government uh, regulation and oversight, not uh, to take the, the finance industry away from the private sector, but to control it. And we learned to do that in the 1930s because of the devastation of the Depression. And because of this change of attitudes and then the focus of business and finance in particular on gaining political power, those those regulations got rolled back either in letter or in spirit. Uh, we didn't create new regu regulations, for example, for changing times. Now, I have, have financiers, I mean, my, always, uh, my understanding was that bankers and financiers, they weren't, uh, they weren't always so rich, I guess. I mean, you'd go in, uh, a banker was, uh, was, you know, back in the day considered as fairly uh, a boring, uh, straight-laced profession, uh, and there was, there was money, but it, there, there wasn't the sort of enormous amount of wealth generated, was it? Right. Well, the, we wanna, exactly. That's a very good point. One, one of the uh, interesting m moments in economic history is when J.P. Morgan died. He was the great financier, as you know, of the late 1800s and early 1900s. In fact, there's never been anybody like him again. Uh, but when he died, Andrew Carnegie, I believe it was, said, my gosh, I didn't know he was so poor. <laughs> Wall Street people did not make nearly what the industrial uh, owners of industry made back then. That all changed, and that's partly why the thesis of this book is that individuals were responsible for what happened. It was not some great, uh, inevitable, uh, historical force 
uh, that created our problems. It were, they were individuals, and I tell the story in terms of individuals, and it's a complex story, but I think uh, when you tell it in terms of individuals, a very readable one, uh, people began to get very rich by taking advantage of ever-loosening regulations, and this led to bad decision-making. Loans to third world countries, which were crazy. Uh, takeovers of companies, which were crazy, at crazy prices that resulted in a lot of pressure on cutting jobs and even R&D, but made billionaires of leveraged buyout specialists and takeover specialists. Crazy investments by savings and loan institutions that were deregulated in one of the most, forgive this word, but one of the most idiotic pieces of legislation in 1982 America ever produced. And in the, two, in the 1990s, we all remember the high technology fantasies. We would sit around and say, these are fantasies, and it would go on and on. Why? In large part, not in small part, in large part, because Wall Street people were making so much money issuing securities to launch these companies at high prices for which they'd make 5 or 7% that day of that take, and on and on to the housing craziness of the 2000s misallocation of our precious capital, which could have gone into productive investment that could have built the foundation of the company, country, uh, all coupled with very low tax rates, you know, very low which, tax and, rates. And that, I presume, also freed up a lot of sort of almost extraneous capital for which to drive uh, these type of transactions. I think so. You know, if you're getting, you have a very low capital gains rate, why not just keep speculating? Why not keep investing this money for the short run and, and you know, make these uh, big gains, especially if you have a little knowledge about what's going on or a little, you know, you're uh, tied to a group that might not might know what's going on. And, uh, and uh, in particular in the early 2000s, you can borrow, if you're a big company, at very low rates, leverage up your equity, just like we all do with the home. You know, we put 10% up for a home. And when that home price goes up, you know, we're making a big return on our investment. Well, these guys did this in silver, gold, international currencies, international and uh, federal you know, government bonds and so forth. And uh, what a circus. What a circus it's been. But I think, by and large, it damaged America. Could yes. I say why it damaged America? I, I yes. Mean, you know, the, the answer to this, Alan Greenspan, who is one of the – Frankly, and I also I don't like to make personal attacks, but he he and I, I avoid that in this book. I try to be dispassionate in this book and tell it as it is. But Greenspan does come across as one of the main villains of the time. Alan Greenspan would have said, "Well, we ha we had to allow this wild over speculation and these bad investments in order to get the good investments." But over this period, productivity, output per hour of work, which drives living standards, did not rise at historically rapid rates. Capital investment was strong only in a few years of this 40-year period, strong by historical standards. And wages, as we know, have stagnated. And for men, they're actually lower today. The typical man today makes less than the typical man did after inflation in 1969. So the benefits did not flow. Uh, the argument is bogus. I, you know, I've also read, and I believe it was in uh, Jared Diamond's collapse, that the, uh, the, the great societies uh, of the past have essentially collapsed when finance um, hit a certain percentage, I believe it was in the upper 20 uh, percentage points, of, uh, uh, of the economy. And uh, that simply is that simply a function of the fact that you are there is so much wealth that is being misallocated that is in some way been taken out of the real economy and created almost a secondary economy which is creating a tremendous imbalance within a society. I believe there's some truth to that. I don't believe there's enough empirical information to say there is a specific cutoff point in societies when you know we go over the top. I do believe America went over the top. There are two ways of looking at it. One way is almost a Marxist way of looking at it. The economies run out of good investments, so they make these, these crazy financial investments, games people play with each other. The way I look at it is somewhat different. Ga people played games with each other, not because we ran out of possible productive investment in the economy, but because it was so much easier to make a lot of money 
in finance. You didn't have to take the risk the long, and, and, uh, and undertake the long-term unknowns of regular investment, the way capitalism should really work. It was just easier, especially if you could cheat. And there was a heck of a lot of cheating and lying and manipulation and inside information over these 40 years. And so, you know, you, your, your book does uh, focus uh, intensely on, on individuals like uh, Walter Riston and uh, Bosky and Greenspan. And I think it, 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 it shows that this, was not, uh, this is not a natural phenomenon. I mean, it, it takes individuals. But on some level, there's also... There has to be a context, and the enablers uh, who who have allowed this to happen, and when we think about the reason why we organize as a society, why we have governments, is to ensure on some level that we do have allocation of resources that benefits the most amount of people possible. And right. and, and, and so what... what what can we do? Where where was the context? Where were the enablers? Where was that problematic? And what can we do to sort of to, to fix this? Well, I think the enablers, frankly, we have to blame ourselves to some degree. This belief that government is uh, not necessarily not necessary unless proven necessary. This belief that uh, overcame the nation. Now, partly that occurred because some people were so effective at controlling. The, e the economic debate in Washington. But partly, uh, you, and I try to explain this, these are the complex events of history. Partly it came out of the very difficult times in the 1970s with both soaring unemployment and soaring inflation. And uh, people needed a scapegoat. Government became that scapegoat. And everybody climbed aboard, including the Democrats. And pretty soon deregulation and weaker government became the order of the day. I teach kids still believe that. They say, why should government get in the way of private markets? Even after this devastation we had, it became deeply ingrained in us, and people took advantage, and leadership did. Nobody rose. To, nobody effectively rose, or few people effectively rose to counteract that. And I think President Obama has not been sufficiently effective. People always say, why don't we get the reforms we got after the Depression or during the Depression, the level of reform? And I say one reason is we avoided that Depression because of the lessons we learned. We avoided the severity of it. Uh, so people are not so scarred and hurt, although they are very scarred and hurt. But secondly, we don't have FDR. Individuals make a difference. Mm -hmm. FDR took on the battle, took on the fight, and told it like it was. And he made mistakes, but basically he was willing to do battle and be a leader. I think if I have one message for people, and if this book has one message, and it's a book of stories. I mean, history is a story, and I try to make it a narrative uh, that I think is an accurate one. Uh, and, uh, but... Uh, Americans should not back, sit back and think we're just going to muddle through and be okay. Nations are, don't necessarily wind up okay. We've got to start taking responsibility for this mess much more seriously. And, and I, I know you have to go. I have one, one final question, because one thing that strikes me over this 30-year this period, and, and particularly in the last 20, is this notion of uh, money and and greed uh, almost as an ascendant value in our society do you think that this was a a function of the tremendous wealth that was generated in the hands of 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 a few and it created a sense that uh money became uh more relevant in people's lives more important to accrue more more of a status symbol or yes. or huh. it, vice versa yeah, I think that, that by and large we became a culture of money. We can't, you know, the, I, I, the, I can't imagine, who could have ever imagined that people would get on television and claim our problem is that teachers make too much money, as they've been doing during the recent, uh, the recent raucous in Wisconsin and elsewhere. It is just unbelievable abusing teachers. Teachers, may, there may be some requirement for reform there. But the idea of saying, and, and I get people who say, oh, the, but those bankers created jobs. Mm. Wrong. Those bankers lost 8 million jobs a couple of years ago, 8 million to 11 million, and we're not, we haven't gotten them back yet. 
So we've really got to wake up here. The, a, a capitalist free market system is great, but it is only one sphere of an economy and a social system. There is another sphere, the cooperation government sphere, and they've got to work together. In the last 30 to 40 years, this competition business free market sphere has pushed out and denigrated the idea of cooperation. And the societies that are going to succeed in this century are the societies that understand the value of cooperation uh, and mix it with the value of business and the great creativity and energy that business can release. Jeff Madrick, thanks so much for joining us. The book is The Age of Greed, The Triumph of Finance and the Decline of America, 1970 to the Present. Uh, we will have a link to that book uh, on Amazon at majority.fm. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, it's a great read, and it's an incredibly, I think it's uh, the paramount issue of our day. Thank you for reading it, Sam, and thank you for inviting me.